connected way in which he appears to be talking. The inner vision, as I say, is this mysterious concept of the coincidence of authority and liberty. And the coincidence derives from the fact that in order to make men at once free and capable of living with each other in society and capable of obeying the moral law, what you want is for men to want that which the moral law in fact enjoys. In short, the problem is something this kind. You at once want to give people unlimited liberty because otherwise they cease to be men. And yet you want to, them to live according to the rules. Well, if they love the rules, then they will want the rules, not because the rules are rules, but because they love them. If a man, if your problem is, how shall a man be at once free and yet in chains? Then you say, well, but if the chains are not imposed upon him, if the chains are not something with which he's bound by some external force, if the chains are something which he chooses himself because it is an expression of his nature, if the chains are something which he generates from within him as an inner ideal, if it is what he above all wants in the world, then the chains aren't chains. A man who is self-trained is not a prisoner. And so Rousseau ultimately says, man is everywhere born free, is born free, and yet he's everywhere in chains. Well, what sort of chains? If there are the chains of convention, if there are the chains of the tyrant, if there are the chains of other people who want to use you for their own ends, then of course these are chains, and you must fight and you must struggle, and nothing must stand in the way of the great battle for individual self-assertion and freedom. But if the chains are chains of your own making, if the chains are simply the rules which you, with your own inner reason, or because of the grace which pours in while you lead the simple life, or because of the voice of conscience, or the voice of God, or the voice of nature, which are all referred to by Rousseau as if they were almost the same thing, if the chains are simply rules, the very obedience to which is the most freest, strongest, most spontaneous expression of your own inner nature, then the chains no longer bind you. Self-control is not control. Self-control is freedom. And so Rousseau gradually um, progresses towards this peculiar idea that what is wanted is men who want to be connected with each other in the way in which the state connects them. The original chains are some form of coercion which the tyrant used to employ in order to force you to do his will. And it is this which poets have been so wicked, wickedly, um, it is this which poets have so wickedly crowned with our garlands. It is this which writers have so fulsomely and so immorally tried to conceal by the encomia which they have paid to mere force, to mere authority. But what is wanted is something very really different. What is wanted, I quote Rousseau again, is the surrender of each individual with all his rights to the whole community. If you surrender yourself to the whole community, then how can you not be free? For who coerces you? Not X, not Y, not this man, not that man, not this institution, not that institution. It is the state which coerces you. But what is the state? The state is you and others such as you, all seeking your common good. And there is for Rousseau a common good. For if there were not something which is the common good of the whole society, which doesn't conflict with individual goods, if there weren't such things, then the question, how shall we live, what shall we do, what shall we, a group of men together, do, would become meaningless. And that cannot possibly be allowed. Consequently, Rousseau develops the notion of the general will. But from the notion, the harmless notion of a contract, which after all is a semi-commercial affair, which after all is merely a kind of undertaking voluntarily entered into, and I suppose ultimately revocable, by which human beings come together and agree to do certain things which will uh, lead to their common happiness, but which, if it leads to their common misery, they can, of course, abandon. From the notion of a social contract as a perfectly voluntary act on the part of individuals who remain individuals and who pursue each his own good, you gradually, in Rousseau, get the notion of the general will as almost the personified willing of a large, superpersonal entity, of something called the state, which is no longer the crushing Leviathan of Hobbes, but which is now something like a team, something like a church, some kind of unity in diversity, something which is a greater than I, something in which I think my personality only in order to find it again. It, it, there is a kind of mysterious moment at which he mystically passes from the notion of a lot of individuals in voluntary free relations to each other, each pursuing his own good, 
to the notion of submitting to something which is greater than myself, which is myself and yet greater than myself, the whole, the co community. The steps by which he reaches there are peculiar and worth examining for a moment. I say to myself that there are certain things which I desire, and if I'm stopped from having them, then I'm, I'm not free. And this is the worst thing which can befall me. I then say to myself, what is it that I desire? I desire the satisfaction of my nature. Well, if I'm wise and if I employ reason, then I discover in what this satisfaction lies. The true satisfaction of any one man cannot clash with the true satisfaction of any other man, for if um, it clashed, nature would not be harmonious, and one truth would collide with another, which is logically impossible. Now, uh, it may be that other men are trying to frustrate me. Why are they trying to frustrate me? If I know that I am right, if I know that what I seek is the true good, then people who oppose me must in some way be in error about what it is that they seek. No doubt they think they're seeking the good, they seek their own liberty, but they're seeking it along the wrong path. Therefore, I have a right to prevent them. In virtue of what have I right to, this right to prevent them? Not because I want something which they don't want, not because I am superior to them, not because I am stronger than they are, not even because I am wiser than they are, for they are human beings with immortal souls and who so passionately believe in equality. It is because if they knew what they wanted, they would seek what I seek. The fact that they don't know doesn't mean that they don't really know. It is the word real, which is really the treacherous word here. To s what Rousseau really wishes to convey is that every man is potentially good. Nobody can be altogether bad. If they allowed the natural goodness to well out from them, then they would want what is right. But the fact they don't want it merely means that they don't understand their own nature. But the nature is there. To say that a man, for Rousseau, to say that a man wants what is bad, although potentially he wants what is good, is the same as to say that in some secret part of himself, with his real self, if he were himself, if he were as he ought to be, if he were his true self, then he would seek the good. And from that it is but a small step to saying there is a sense in which he already seeks this good, but doesn't know it. It's true that when he, if you ask him what it is he wants, he may enunciate some very evil purpose. But the true man inside him, the immortal soul, that which if only he allowed nature to penetrate his breast, if only he lived the right kind of life, he would realize what his true self, that self, seeks something else. Now I know what that true self seeks, for it must seek what I seek, for I know that what I am now is my own true self and not my own illusory self. It is this notion of the two selves which really operates in Rousseau's thought. And therefore, when I do, when I stop him from pursuing his evil ends, even when I put him in jail, in order to uh, prevent him from causing damage to other good men, even if I execute him as an abandoned criminal, I do this not for utilitarian reasons, but in order to give happiness to others, not even for attributive reasons, in order to punish him for the evil that he does. I do it because that is what his own inner, better, more real self would have done if only he had allowed it to speak. And so I set myself up as the authority, not merely over my actions, but over his. And this is what is meant by the famous phrase in Rousseau about forcing men to be free. To force a man to be free is to force him to behave in a rational manner. A man is free who gets what he wants. What he truly wants is a rational end. If he doesn't want a rational end, he doesn't truly want. If he doesn't want a rational end, what he wants is not true freedom, but false freedom. I force him to do certain things which will make him happy. He will be grateful for it to me if ever he discovers what his own true self is.